Thanks to Komogorov, we now have fairly simple conditions to tell whether a particular stochastic process has a continuous version and whether a sequence of stochastic processes is tight in the sense of their laws on path space. Now, tightness played an important role in our discussions of weak convergence, and that's where it's going to play a role now as well. Remember that we are thinking of continuous stochastic processes as continuous path space valued random variables. We can therefore talk about all kinds of convergence of those random variables. And in particular, we're gonna talk about weak convergence of sequences of stochastic processes. Kolmogorov's tightness criteria are going to give us a way to prove weak convergence from even weaker conditions, which can be verified without much reference to the particular continuous path space valued structure. That is, the even weaker notion of convergence that we might be interested in is convergence of finite dimensional distributions. If Xn is a sequence of stochastic processes taking values in some state space S, then we say that that sequence Xn converges to some process X infinity in finite dimensional distributions if for any finite collection of times T1 through Tk the random vector xn of t1 through xn of tk, which is now a random vector taking values in s to the k, if that random vector converges weakly to the random vector x infinity, t1 through x infinity of tk. Just to be clear, what we mean by that, as a refresher on weak convergence, is that for every continuous bounded function on s to the k, the expected value of that function of the vector xn of t1 through xn of tk converges as n goes to infinity to the expected value of f at x infinity at t1 through x infinity at tk. Now this is a good deal weaker than weak convergence in the sense that we're interested in up here, as we'll see as the first easy direction of the following theorem. But it turns out that in the presence of tightness, which we know how to guarantee from Kolmogorov's condition, for example, the two actually are equivalent. And that's our main theorem for this short lecture. If Xn is a sequence of continuous stochastic processes on a separable complete metric space S, then the following are equivalent. The sequence xn converges weakly to x infinity, that is, the laws of these stochastic processes converge weakly to this law as a probability measure on path space. In other words, the expected value of capital F of xn converges to the expected value of capital F of x infinity for all continuous bounded functions on the path space. So those are continuous functions of continuous paths. That's true if and only if xn converges in finite dimensional distributions in this sense here to the process x infinity and the sequence of laws of xn is a tight family of probability measures. This precisely mirrors the theorem that we proved way back in lecture 23.1 and 23.2 for real valued random variables, that vague convergence and tightness give weak convergence. And we're going to use the tools from those lectures, in particular Prohorov's theorem, here in order to prove this. So let's first prove the easier forward direction. If xn converges weakly to x infinity, then xn converges in finite dimensional distributions and is tight. So the first statement that is tight was already proved in lecture 23.2. This is the converse direction of Prohorov's theorem, that weak convergence implies tightness. We proved this only in the special case that xn and x infinity were rd valued random variables. The general proof is not much different, and you can see the relevant section of driver's notes if you'd like all of those details. Now, we also need to see that weak convergence of these stochastic processes implies the weaker notion of finite dimensional distributions converging. So what does it mean that xn converges weakly to x infinity? Well, as we wrote on the last slide, it means this. If I have any function on path space, 
that is itself a continuous function in the d infinity metric and is a bounded function, then the expected value of that function of the whole process converges to the expected value of the function of the putative limit. Well, in particular, some good examples of these are cylinder functions. If I take a finite collection of times t1 through tk, and I take any continuous bounded function on k copies of the state space, then I could take a function f of a path omega to be little f of omega of t1 through omega of tk. This is what we might call a cylinder function. And that defines a continuous bounded function of the omega variable. To see that, we can just compute directly and quite easily. First, we need to give a metric for the topology on s to the k. And the one that will work best here, of course, all of them are going to be equivalent since there's only finitely many components, is dk of two vectors x and y, each in s to the k, will be the maximum over j between 1 and k of the distance in the metric space between the components xj and yj. Now, in terms of that metric, the continuity of the function f tells us that for any epsilon, we can find a delta such that the distance in terms of that metric on s to the k between x and y being less than delta implies that the distance between f at x and f at y in the real line is less than epsilon. And so in particular, if I have two paths, omega and omega prime, whose uniform distance from each other is less than that delta, then the dk distance from the vector omega of t1 up to omega of tk to omega prime of t1 up to omega prime of tk, well, that's going to be the maximum over j of the distance from omega of tj to omega prime of tj but that's certainly less than or equal to the supremum over all times, not just those finitely many, of the distance between omega of t and omega prime of t, which is the definition of the distance between the two paths. So if that is assumed to be less than delta, then that implies that f of this vector minus f of this vector is less than epsilon. But f of this vector is capital F of omega. And f of this vector is capital F of omega prime. And that tells us, therefore, that capital F of omega minus capital F of omega prime is less than epsilon, giving us the continuity that we need. And boundedness is very straightforward to see that the range here will be contained in the range here which is bounded. So if we have weak convergence in this sense here, then that in particular holds for such cylinder functions which are continuous and bounded, but that exactly says that we get weak convergence of this vector to this one, which is the definition of convergence of finite dimensional distributions, giving us the forward easy direction of this theorem. For the reverse, we're going to use Prokhorov's theorem. Suppose that our sequence of stochastic processes converges in finite dimensional distributions and is a tight family. We want to show that it converges weakly, and to do that, we're going to argue by contradiction. Suppose that it does not converge weakly. Well, that means precisely that there is some small tolerance epsilon and some continuous bounded function on path space, so that this does not converge to this, meaning that there's some subsequence, nk, for which the expected value of the difference here is always greater than or equal to epsilon. Okay, well now let's work with that subsequence, xnk, of our original sequence of probability measures on path space. We're now going to use Prokhorov's theorem, which applies in this case because s is separable, and so therefore is this metric space, the path space. Prokhorov's theorem therefore tells us that there will be a weakly convergent subsequence of this sequence. 
So there's a further subsequence of indices, KL, and a random variable Y taking values in this space, so that that sub-subsequence XNKL converges weakly to Y. And let's note, from what we computed on the previous slide, weak convergence of these processes certainly implies convergence in finite dimensional distributions. So now we have two limit random variables, one that is a limit and one that is a limit in finite dimensional distributions, but we're assuming is not a weak limit. And let's compare them in terms of this function f here that doesn't do well with the weak limit definition. That is, let's look at the expected value of f at y minus the expected value of f at x infinity. Well, by this weak convergence here, this is the limit of the expected value of f at x and kl. But by our contradictory construction, all of those terms are greater than or equal to epsilon, and so their limit is also greater than or equal to epsilon. Okay, but here's the rub. Xn converges by assumption to x infinity in finite dimensional distributions, and so it's easy to see that any subsequence will as well. Xn k l converges in finite dimensional distributions to x infinity, whereas we established above that Xn k l converges in finite dimensional distributions to y. So we conclude from there that these two processes, y and x infinity, they have the same finite dimensional distribution since they're both limits in finite dimensional distributions of the same subsequence of the original sequence xn. Now we will use the following claim, which you're going to prove on your homework. If x and y are two continuous stochastic processes that have the same finite dimensional distributions, then in fact, they have the same law. That is to say, thinking of these stochastic processes as path-valued random variables taking values in the continuous paths in the state space S, the Borel probability measure that describes the law of those random variables is the same measure. In particular, that means that for any continuous bounded function on that space, the expected value of f at x is equal to the expected value of f at y. Proving this boils down to the fact that the cylinder sigma field we use to construct these processes is the same as the Borel sigma field over this space equipped with the supnorm topology, which is a fact we've alluded to and will prove in a future lecture. But now we have a problem. We have two continuous stochastic processes, the original x infinity and the new process y. Both of them are limits in finite dimensional distributions of subsequences of the same original sequence. That means that these two have the same finite dimensional distributions. They're both continuous, but we have a continuous bounded function f where the expected values of them differ by at least epsilon. That is a big fat contradiction to this fact here, and that proves by contradiction that in fact this y was impossible. In fact, xn does converge weakly to x infinity completing the proof. Next time, we're going to use this result together with the tightness criterion we proved in the last lecture in order to prove Donsker's invariance principle. We can actually construct Brownian motion pathwise as a rescaled weak limit of random walks.